You speak words of wisdom, the promise of glory, the power of the presence of God. Have faith in God. Let your hope rest on the faith He has placed in Morning, everyone, and welcome to MCC at Home. A particularly big welcome to you this morning. If you're a visitor, this is your first, maybe second or third time with us. Great to have you along. This morning, we've got a hold of uh, fun and hopefully encouragement and edification coming your way. I'll be continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. After that, we will have a, um, a quick chat, a bit more of a get to know you with Janaya and Mike. And then following that, we will have, um, we're going to have uh, communion, of course, uh, communion with Jim, part two, following on from part one last week. And then we'll have the news, Joel plays another song, and then we'll have um, children's story as well. So uh, we've got a whole lot to look forward to this morning. And again, I'm glad that you can be with us. But before we get into it proper, please let me open with a, pr- with a prayer. So please pray, pray with me. Father, we thank you for our time together. Uh, We thank you that even though this way of doing church, of being church, isn't exactly ideal, we thank you that nevertheless, uh, it's a whole lot better than nothing. So we don't take this for granted. Uh, We thank you that you've provided a means through which we can stay in touch with each other and still hopefully, again, encourage each other too, Father. So we thank you for that. Father, we pray that as we'll... uh, as we'll hear about soon, that you'll help us be pure in heart. We pray, Father, that we will have a, um, an undivided focus on loving and following you. Um, Father, we know that in life there are just so many good options, so many fantastic causes, different paths that we could pursue, so many good things that we could, that we could devote our time to. But I pray, Father, that um, you will place our love and our earnest desire to become more and more like you and to bring you glory. I pray that you will make this our first and foremost desire and love in life. Amen. Thanks. And now let's dive back into the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're looking at number six of the Beatitudes, the intro to the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
So I want to spend our time looking at three things regarding this passage. Number one, what is meant by heart? Number two, what is meant by pure? And three, what may be meant by seeing God? So heart, what is meant by heart? <laughs> and talk about a word whose meaning has been completely hijacked by pop culture. So I'm guessing that most of us associate heart with feelings and emotions. And that's largely courtesy of songs like Achy Breaky Heart, Listen to Your Heart, that was for Phil and Joel, by the way. Yes. My Heart Will Go On, uh, and he, or even a good song like Your Cheating Heart by Hank Williams. That's for you, Joe. So when we hear heart, it's just so easy to think of the affections, um, our emotions, and it's even easier to separate it from your head, and maybe even your will. So lines like, just follow your heart, a line that must have launched a thousand greeting cards, is pitched against something like, listen, just sit down and put together a sober cost-benefit analysis. Or there's the famous Pascal quote, the heart has its reasons which reason knows nothing of. Deep, man. Well, drop that at your next dinner party and see what happens. Now, see, this kind of concept of the heart does at least two things. It reduces the definition of heart to something that's one-dimensional, and that is emotions. And it leads us to misunderstanding what Jesus and his audience, what they would have understood when they used or heard the term. So heart, cardia, with a K, in New Testament Greek. It can be described as the fulcrum of your most fundamental longings, a visceral, subconscious orientation to the world. So says the theologian Scott McKnight. So note, it's not just feelings, not less than those feelings either, but it's a whole orientation to the world. Now, along these lines, Lloyd-Jones describes the Jews, the Hebrews, viewing the heart as being the center of a person, the fount from which everything else springs from. And the center includes feelings and mind, the intellect, and will, so what we actually do. So in summary, it's the center of a whole person. That's what makes it so critical. If it was something to do with just my feelings, then maybe I could use my intellect and will to talk myself around. But no, the heart is the whole package. So please, I don't want to kill the magic of any great power ballads, and I want to enjoy my Lord Byron as much as the next guy. But for the rest of this talk, or when it comes to reading the Bible generally, it may be worth recalibrating what we mean by heart. That's the first point. Point number two, what is meant by being pure, pure in heart? So from what I've read, we're looking at two related and overlapping meanings. So pure means clean, untainted, unstained in, in, um, in this regard. It's everything to do with having the character of Jesus, having one's will, personality, and life completely united and oriented to God. So Jesus was without any moral blemish, just like his father. And Jesus said that he was only capable of doing what he saw his father doing and willing. So there's pure in that important sense. And you see later in the sermon that Jesus contrasts this kind of internal purity with the kind that is completely surface level, purely external, and doing so, doing those things for the sake of reputation or standing. So he uses the Pharisees, the religious elite of the day, the, mo the, the, the moral pillars of the community at the time to make the point. He says of them, you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you were full of extortion and wickedness. You were like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So to summarize, purity in this regard is an internal, intrinsic moral purity, and it's being undertaken for the right reasons, not for show, not for reputation, not for the wrong reasons. It's wanting to be like God out of a love for God. That's the first meaning of the term purity. But I want to focus more on the second and related meaning. And that's, and that's more about, to use the same word in quick succession, focus. Purity in terms of focus. What do I mean by this? So this is a slight tangent, but please stick with me. My default when it comes to getting to know someone or finding out things about them is probably going to involve asking them, what do you think about X? Or, what do you believe about X? Now, built into those kind of questions is that our lives are fundamentally driven along by what we think. So, an assumption is that we're so rational, so cognitive, that what we think drives our behaviors, our will, and maybe even some of our emotions. Now, I'm not suggesting that what we think has no influence over our will and emotions. 
What I am going to suggest is that as humans, we're not nearly as simple and as neat as that. This explanation that our lives are primarily, if not exclusively driven by our heads, that's way too reductionistic. Dare I say it, it's almost, it's almost naive. The fundamental question isn't so much what do I think or what do I believe. Instead, and this sounds almost controversial to say out loud, the big question is the one that Jesus asks his followers and even would-be followers regularly. And it's this, what do you want? What do you want? Now just stop for a minute and think about that. If you ask me what I thought um, the meaning of life was, for example, or what I believed my big goal should be over the next six months, or, um, or anything of that kind of nature, I could give you some decent answers off the top of my head. And that's because I'm reasonably articulate and can deal okay with abstract concepts, and I'm probably too introspective by nature. But if you ask me, what, what do I want? Wow. To answer that honestly, that can be so much harder. Because going back to our terms, that's, a, that's not a head question. It can't be answered solely via my cognition. It's a heart issue. That is, it's a whole of person issue. My thoughts, my feelings, my will. The core of who I am. That makes it so much harder. And the other thing that makes it hard is that when you scratch the surface of it, most of us, most of us want or love multiple things at once. So let me give you an example. And this is a, like a, a kind of example on steroids, but I think it makes the point. Think of some of the most classic TV shows and movies of the past 20 plus years. You've got Fight Club, American Beauty, Breaking Bad, and Sopranos. Now, all of these feature protagonists who are smart, relatively wordy guys. You could ask them what they thought, what they believed, and they'd offer a pretty compelling account. But their lives, their lives all eventually unravel due to actually wanting conflicting things, regardless of what they said they thought. So you may remember that Tony Soprano, of Sopranos fame, he was a mob boss, but also he was a guy in therapy. And much of that show was actually seeing Tony in the therapy's office talking, talking, talking about what he thought, about what he believed, about what he felt, etc., etc. But part of the show's brutal magic was showing the disjuncture between the Tony you saw in the therapy and what he said he believed there, and the Tony who was a violent, ruthless mob boss. Or Tony, the loving father and husband, versus Tony, the philandering womanizer. And surprise, surprise, Tony couldn't be all those things he wanted to be over the long term. It turns out that being a violent mob boss, as well as a long-term family man, those things are compatible. Being a loving husband and a playboy are mutually exclusive. Or to use a more classic religious example, you've got King David, a man after God's own heart, it says. An upstanding moral example, a giant killer for God. But who in an instant is overcome by another love or want. He wants to be the guy who can have any woman he desires. And so he shamefully takes Bathsheba. So they're two extreme examples, but how far off are we from that? Don't you find that you have competing, often jostling wants and loves? So for example, you wanna be the successful business person, but you also wanna be the devoted parent and husband or wife. You wanna be the guy who is, um, who's actually a responsible adult who can be steady, reliable, and create some kind of order in their world. But sometimes you just want to be that 22-year-old dude who just, like, he's still house-sharing with his mates and lives from paycheck to paycheck. So to summarize, we, we're complex beings that are largely driven and oriented by wants, desires, loves, and these loves are bound up with notions of what the good life is. So the author and theologian James Smith puts it like this. To be human is to be for something, directed towards something, oriented towards something. To be human is to be on the move, pursuing something, after something. We are like existential sharks, great line. We're like existential sharks. We have to move to live. We are not just static containers for ideas. We are dynamic creatures directed towards some end. Great quote. And where do these orientations, these directions reside? Again, Smith writes, our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behavior flow. Our wants reverberate from where? From our heart, the epicenter of the human person. Thus, scripture says and counsels, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. 
And to make it even more complicated, these loves, like we said, they're often competing with each other. They're often jostling for position. Again, whether you're Tony Soprano or King David. So sorry for that little tangent, but it brings us back around to this second and important meaning of purity of heart. Singular focus. A pure heart has a single big love, an exclusive overarching desire, a lone, large, life-defining want that is guiding it towards a specific end, seeing God. The pure in heart, they aren't a mess of competing desires, low-level life plans, contradictory bucket lists, and conflicting identities. They aren't being pulled in different directions and experiencing all the frustration that can come with that. Instead, they believe, as Augustine wrote hundreds of years ago, that God has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in him. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's effectively saying, blessed are those whose exclusive overarching desire and love is for God. And that, and that makes sense, right? Because as, again, Augustine said, that's what our hearts uh, were designed for. That's the comforting thing. The challenging thing is that it's a total commitment. Again, Smith writes, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into your mind. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, your longings. Jesus wants everything at the cost of everything else. For example, he says that you can't serve both God and money. That's the purity of heart that is required. That means loving God over and above every competing love. That means seeing ourselves, first and foremost, as disciples, followers of Jesus, even before we see ourselves as partners, mothers, good employees, etc. That means being willing to sacrifice reputation, social status, fantastic travel stories, chalking up novel experiences, etc., if necessary, for the sake of loving Jesus. Now, the first bit of good news is that in viewing these other desires as secondary, it saves us from the restlessness and disappointment that comes with trying to make a substitute the real thing. So those other desires, there's nothing wrong with them usually, as long as we don't make them the main thing. But when they become the main thing, they can become monsters. Being pure in heart and desiring God first and foremost, that saves us from such a fate. But lastly, and this is point number three, the promise is that the pure of heart will see God. Now, it's hard to kind of quantify what that may involve, but we can be certain that it'll be an amazing experience. There are accounts in the Bible of people who get glimpses of God, and they were overawed in a good sense. If you believe that this is what we were created for, then I imagine it'll feel like the ultimate homecoming, being in the presence of the being who made you, who knows you better than any other, and not only knows you, but loves you, loves you more than any other. And feeling that personal love, being immersed in it, as well as being face to face with the power, the might, the splendor and perfection of God. It'll be a truly ecstatic experience. But maybe you're skeptical of all that right now. Maybe you struggle to even believe in God. Well, then what about this? Just as an experiment, Pray to a God that you may not even be certain is there and ask him to help you try living with this purity of heart. Ask that he'll empower you to live more like Jesus, selflessly, courageously, lovingly, and maybe, just maybe, you'll start to see glimpses of God in the short term, whether that be through circumstances or even other people. At least consider this. You have a heart, which means you'll love something, You'll love something in a kind of ultimate way. And this thing that you love, this notion of a, of a good life that is taking you towards, this will end up shaping you in some way as well. If nothing else, it's worth being mindful of that. Now, you may not like hearing it. You may understandably disagree. But I think we've all got some kind of religion. We're all banking our lives the way we live on something. Or maybe you're a long-term Christian watching this. Maybe for people like us, the trap is that we can get complacent about this. The words can so easily roll off our tongues. Of course I love God more than anything else. Well, if we love God as a being, not just an idea or a principle, then presumably our love for him is growing. 
And looking back, we should be able to see how it's grown over time. You've found out more about him. Your character has become more like his. And presumably too, over time, we'll see some sacrifices that we've made for him. Because no doubt, to love someone is to make sacrifices for them. What does loving God in that pure, singular fashion cost us? Anything? Or are we trying to have our cake and eat it too? Just a dose of religion on the side. Some spiritual guides have suggested taking regular audits of our loves. What am I spending my time, my money, my headspace on? Where does my mind wander to when it's in neutral? Martin Luther, the great reformer, wrote, wherever, whatever, sorry, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. But once again, this isn't just a matter of trying harder or just giving it your best. First and foremost, let's ask God to enable us to love him more with that purity, with that singularity of heart. Because ultimately, we can't reach that ideal without him. And after that, let's then try our best, knowing that it will never be enough, but that God has given us a part to play in our becoming more like him regardless. God loves you. He loves your heart. He's created it to find him. So why go selling it out to anything less? Thanks for listening. And as always, please let me know if you've got any questions. And now, let's go talk to Janaya and Mike. Welcome, Janaya. <laughs> Thanks again for coming in and taking the time uh, to talk to me. Really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure the people at home are going to appreciate this as well. So first question, right off the bat, as far as I know, you guys haven't been in Tasmania uh, that long. So how long exactly has it been and what brought you guys here? It's going on two years now. It's two years. Almost wow. two years. Yeah, yeah. it be two years at the end of July. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. We didn't really speak to anyone besides our direct family for the first eight months, so that's why it seems like less. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really know anyone. Long so. breaking in period. <laughs> yeah. um, why did we come here? Well, we just wanted a change from, mm. from Perth originally and um, just the commute was too long. Mike was basically only getting the weekends with the family and we just thought, oh, let's change things up and we looked mm -hmm. at moving house and then I just threw Tasmania into the mix and you applied for a job and six weeks later, here we are, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. it was like we made the mistake of coming here for a holiday. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. This place is amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, we were already thinking about moving and then yeah. I'm like, why don't we just move a bit further? Yeah. And it's one of those things where you know, just kind of threw it out there as she does and yeah. I failed to call her bluff <laughs> as I usually do. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, here we are. Work and or study wise, what do you guys do respectively? Software developer. I work for RCT Insurance. Um, do some other software dev stuff on the side sometimes as well. And yeah, it takes up all my all my working time. Um, it's doing the same thing in Perth mm -hmm. for handful of years, how long? Forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a teacher's degree, um, but I don't really want to teach older children, anyone above the age of about six. So um, I'm at the moment looking into um, my zero to five speciality. Mm. Um, and other than that, I am, I've had many previous careers. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm a mum to three lovely children. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you come from an estate, you arrive in Margate, how did you first like roll up and become part of MCC of church? I didn't speak to anyone for like about eight months yeah. and I found myself getting a little bit depressed that I didn't mm -hmm. have any friends um, and didn't know anyone. So I joined this like mum app type thing mm -hmm. um, and I think within like 24 hours I um, connected with Ashley Tenalia oh. and she turned out to be the very best possible person to meet as yeah. a transplant um, and because she knows everyone and everything yeah. and she just goes right this is what we do on Monday this is what we do on Tuesday this is what we do on Wednesday and so on um, and so she kind of got me in yeah. and just gradually over the space of probably s six months mm -hmm. we started talking about it um, and um, I said, oh, you know, like I've, you know, I've been getting this, I've been feeling this thing that I, you know, that church is something that I want to get back into. I need to um, strengthen my relationship with God and, um, 
you know, not knowing anything, but mm -hmm. knowing that um, I, I, I have been a Catholic all my life, but had found myself very dissatisfied with that mm -hmm. um, way that religion goes at the moment. And um, and so I thought, and actually just said, oh, come to one of the women's meetups. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. I can't just rock up to like a church meetup. Um, but I did and I instantly liked the people. And then she's like, why don't you just come to a service one day? And I said, okay. And so I did and absolutely loved it. Mm. Thought it was common sense mm. church and a great way for me to get back into that and also because I want the kids to um, have a relationship with God and mm -hmm. so I felt that um, me being present you know with church and all of that um, would be a good way to help them you know just start hearing the words yeah. and all that kind of stuff because I haven't um, really done that since mm. Alvi was a baby. Yeah. Yeah. All right. As a church, it feels like we're like kind of again just in the early throes and stages of getting to know you guys, which is uh, which is great. And then of course, social distancing, isolation comes along, and that kind of puts it on pause, which sucks to some degree for some of us. So um, I was wondering, what would a like a close friend or a family member tell someone like me or us? Like, what would they say we should really we should really know about you guys? The children are very loud. <laughs> I was going to say the kids are really loud. <laughs> So basically to find you guys by your children. Well, that's human well, enough, right? Yeah, well, you know, I think they're, they're so loud and distract, excitable, yeah. boisterous, yeah. Um, that you would often see them before us, perhaps. Mm. You would always hear them before us. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're – I think we're very open. We try and be mm -hmm. very open. And mm. um, someone said to me in my youth – um, if you want people to be open with you, you need to mm. be open with them. Sure, yeah. Um, so I've kind of always tried to live like that. And as mm. soon as you start doing that, you realise that that automatically almost yeah. gets you to having quality relationships with people. And, yeah. Um, yeah, like deep relationships and mm. just, you know, you, you skip the surface clutter yep. type stuff. Um, and, and, yeah, you, you you might not like us to begin with, but we'll grow on you like mole. You'll love us in the end. <laughs> like mole. <mom. laughs> <laughs> like a good cheese. <laughs> like a good cheese. <laughs> Your parents are relatively young children, right? So you're stuck on a desert island and you can only pick one. Okay, so on high rotation, the Wiggles or Bluey. Joel thought I was going with you can only pick one child to be stuck with. I honestly <laughs> 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 Which dude do you leave off? He's not a parent yet. That might so. be an easier <laughs> question to answer. Um, <laughs> which one, which one would be the best at hunting for <laughs> yeah, us? That's it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Who can we? Who can we get out? You know, source to do our outsource to do our work. For. <laughs> um, we also bluey. We our children don't really do either of those. Um, <laughs> ours are more haunted house um, or frozen. In terms of a church family, how can we kind of best go about supporting you guys? What can we like pray for you at the moment? Anything kind of stand out? Anything particularly that we can do? I, I think we're okay. We're of pretty... all the people in the world, we're, mm -hmm. we're very fortunate to, to not really be in a position of of kind of needing anything. Mm. You know, we would love another cash, half a million in the bank or something. Yeah. <laughs> So should should you happen to be running a, a, an embezzling scheme or something at the moment, just Any retired throw the numbers out. Yeah, sure, sure. Have... I'll put the word out. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see what we can yeah. do, yeah. Um, we'll take anything. We'll take coins. We're, yeah. we're not um, um, I think one thing, and I hope you're okay with me sharing hmm. this because I didn't talk to you about it before. Yeah, we can cut but, it out. Um, we have been trying to have a, another child. The first three have turned out so well, we thought we'd have another one. Um, um, and it hasn't worked for the mm. last two and a half-ish years. Mm. Um, and then um, just very recently we managed to get pregnant and then we've also lost our baby. Oh, so, um, man, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if, like, I feel that it's, 
going to happen. Yep. Um, I feel like God has said to me, your your next child is coming. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone wanted to give him a bit of a hurry up and get it happening now, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, getting on a bit in age, and I think we sort of just want to finish the fam, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wrap it up and have a nap. Wrap it up and have a nap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Without yeah. consequences. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for yeah. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. Not an easy thing to share, but people will certainly certainly be behind you guys in prayer for that. Yeah, yeah that'd be nice. Yeah. Any help we can get. Yeah, we'll take it. Yeah. 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 Very good. Very good. Well, thanks. Thanks again for um, for coming in, particularly like at a relatively late notice and answering my uh, my long list. Of both applicable and completely <laughs> non pertinent, unrelevant <laughs> questions. Thanks for humoring me for with that. Us. <laughs> no, it's been fun. Yeah, it's fun. Good. Thanks, guys. G'day. Last time I did communion, I said there is a truism that there are only two certainties in life death and taxes, and that I could confirm the latter having worked for the Australian Taxation Office. However, the small act and of remembrance and celebration that we're about to share gives a lie to the first. The death and resurrection of Jesus celebrates the end of the mastery of death. When Jesus rose from the dead, he signalled to the cosmos that de death no longer held sway. His rising also demonstrated that the physical world is not all there is to life that there's another dimension. St. C.S. Lewis describes us as living in a shadow land, that true reality can only be found by faith in Jesus. How much faith? I'll talk about that next time, I said. So now it's next time. How much faith? Enough faith to say yes Jesus. No more. Not what I, the leaders, or some tele-evangelist tells you you need to believe. Just yes. And now we'll take part in communion as we remember Jesus who died for our sins. I'll take the bread and break it and give thanks. And then following that, I'll pour uh, the wine and Matt will give thanks for the cup. And now let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this bread, this symbol of your son's body, given and broken, that we might live. We thank you for this in his name. Amen. And now Matt will give thanks for the drink. Father, thank you for this cup. Thank you for this little reminder of your blood spilled for us. And we, uh, we think of the thief on the cross next to you. Uh, we think there that at the end of his life, all he had to say was yes to you. And that was enough. Amen. Thanks, Jim, for the communion. Thank you to everyone who came along yesterday to the Working Bee at Margate Christian Church. It was really good to uh, get the grounds cleared up 
um, in preparation for the um, doing further work on the playground. Um, as, as you saw last week, the, the ditch has been filled, we've got fill in um, and we're preparing to put up a fence um, so that when we go back to church it should hopefully be well underway. Um, it was really good to, to, for, for us to have a bunch of people who could get there um, and work together on that. Um, we'd like to this week to pray for the One Way Church, which is also in Margate, um, their leaders and Jaco, their pastor. Um, they're facing the same challenges as us, and it's it's good, to, you know, for our fellow churches to to be able to support each other. Um, I'd also want to raise again the Channel Churches Care. Um, this is a partnership between MCC, One Way, Kingra Family Church, and Summerlees Church. Um, we're aiming to offer free um, practical support. Um, to people in the Channel region from anywhere between Huntingfield and down to Woodbridge. Um, we're also offering, um, for those who want it, um, prayer and um, the opportunity to explore Christianity if, if they're interested. Um, we want to really thank the, the financial supporters who have made this, this possible. It's, it's, um, it's really a great cause and um, we really want to get behind it. Um, if you'd like more information about that, um, either reach out to us or check out their website and uh, Facebook page, um, which has more information. Um, and yeah, we want to thank uh, Kristen, and who's overseeing it, and um, all the volunteers who are involved. And we're getting people reaching out to us, and we've, we've started to be able to help them. That's, that's really, really good. I'm now going to pray um, for these things. So if you just join with me. Dear God, we thank you that... Um, we could get along to the church building yesterday and um, work together to, to prepare the, um, the grounds. Um, we want to pray for the One Way Church in, in Margate and um, particularly their, their leaders as, as they transition um, from the current situation to whatever the next phase looks like. And um, we pray for Jaco, their, their pastor in particular. Um, we pray for Channel Church's care um, we thank you that we have an opportunity to, to be able to help other people in the community and we pray that um, you give us wisdom and um, to be able to navigate um, and to be able to support people. And um, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, Al. And thank you for joining us this morning. Again, we don't take it for granted. It's very much appreciated. Next. Joel will play us one more song, and after that, Meg will lead us in the children's story. So now's a great time if you've got some kids scattered around your, your abode at the moment, and they're keen for children's story, now would be a great time to grab them and get them settled. Just one more quick word um, about the service. We're trying to put these together in such a way that they're easily and readily accessible for anyone, not just people who are part of our congregation. So if you know of anyone, maybe they normally go to church but can't get there at the moment, or maybe they're just in a position where, um, I guess, like broader events have got them thinking about faith and a higher purpose to life or any of that kind of stuff, please feel free to share these, whether that be via YouTube or Facebook. Again, we'd encourage you if you think it's appropriate, if you want to, um, that'd be of great encouragement to us as well. And that's got nothing to do with stoking or feeding our egos. Um, I've already had plenty of people get back to me and say that I've got a great face for radio. So it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Again, only if you think that these would be helpful and of use to people in your circles, please feel free. We'd encourage you to share them. That'd be great. Regardless, we'll hopefully see you again this time next week. Thank you for joining us and God bless. Hey everybody. Today we have a video to show you from a group called Quizworks who used to do shows at schools about Jesus. And but because I haven't been able to do that for a little while, they've been making these videos and they they've been happy to share them with us for our Sunday services. So lots of thanks to Quizworks. And you can look them up on YouTube if you'd like to see more of their videos. I like them, they're quite good. So this video is about part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about not judging people. And another way of saying not judging people is, is not thinking that you're better than other people. And so that's what this video is telling us about.
and I found it a little bit funny, so I hope you guys enjoy it too. Is today the day? Yes, Scruff, today is the day. Woohoo! Everyone's gonna see my brilliance. Indeed. Hi everyone, welcome back to QuizWorks Home Delivery. I'm Matt, and I'm the soon-to-be superstar actor Scruff. Today, we're continuing our series looking at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And who are the people that Jesus is teaching? Do it with me. These are people who are chosen by Jesus, called by Jesus, and loved by Jesus too. Now where to? Follow Jesus, live like Jesus, and become like Jesus too. In other words, Jesus' people are going to live differently to the people who don't follow Jesus. Come on, is it time for the video yet? N nearly scruff. Today, we're looking at Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, where, where Jesus talks about not condemning or... Other translations say judging, so that's what we're going to use. Not judging others. This is what Jesus says. Do not judge others and God won't judge you. God will be as hard on you as you are on others. He will treat you exactly as you treat them. You can see the speck in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye. How can you say, my friend, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you don't see the log in your own eye? You're nothing but show-offs. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see how to take the speck out of your friend's eyes. Remember, Jesus uses lots of picture language here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to imagine what this is like now. Woohoo! It's time to watch! The puppets are real. The cases are crazy. The judge is a dog. Welcome to the courtroom of... Judge Scruff. A courtroom? But I didn't do anything. Ooh, ah! mm. <gasps> <gasps> oh, you're going down, boy. Oh. All rise for the Honorable Judge Scruff. Scruff Dog's in the house. <laughs> He's got a. Order! Order in my court! Ah, uh, yeah, I got an order. Ah, uh, chocolate coated bone pizza. Mm. Right. Now I've looked at all the evidence and I can see that you, Mendel, are in big trouble. Me? No question in my mind about but it. Scruff! Uh -huh. That's your honour to you. Oh, Scruff. Your honour. Uh -huh. I don't need to hear any more about it. I can see quite clearly that there is a speck of sawdust in your eye. But you? Uh -huh. It could get infected. It could turn <gasps> all gooey and crusty and then get so bad that it falls out and rolls across the floor and gets stomped on and then there'll be big eye blobs all over my courtroom! <gasps> oh, Gus, you okay? <sighs> but yeah, I'm okay. Right, why don't you tell the court how you got the speck in your eye in the first place? Well, I was in a chicken coop trying to catch a chicken to make my favorite dinner. Roast chicken, wrapped in seaweed. When I kick some sawdust up, right into my eye. Don't you know that whenever you go chicken chasing, you should wear safety goggles, you silly little thing? Ugh! Ah, but um... Uh, no buts about it. I am the judge, and I say, you are guilty! Guilty? Guilty of what? Of being a silly pink guy who doesn't know they should wear safety goggles. But how can you- I can do it because I am the judge. Okay, we've got to get that speck out of your eye right now. Your honor! Ah, it's okay, I will get it. <gasps> He's coming! Right, now, where did it go? Can I have a hand, please? Oh, there you go. What's this? Not that kind of hand. <laughs> Something to get it out with. Yeah. Ah, yeah, this will work. A sword? Scruff, you can't use a sword. Look at your own um, eye, man. Do it. Do it. No, no, no good. Um, something else, please. Come on. A rubber chicken? Scruff, you can't uh, use a yes. rubber chicken. Look chicken. at your own eye. 
No! Casey. Something else! I need something to get it out with! Ah. Uh, yeah. Tongs? This will work. You can't use tongs. Okay, That's now. Just stay still. Look Don't at worry, I'm a professional. Do it. Do it. Do it. What do you mean? Do it. Do it. Do it. Come on, just stay still. Let's just. Do it. Right! Water! Order in my court! What are you all making so much noise about? Psst. There's a blank in your eye. What, what do you mean I got a blank in my eye? What? Where? Right there. Huh? Oh. That little thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's in your right. eye. I'll oh. work around it. No. Oh, Stacy, come on. Oh, 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 worry, I'll get it. I'm a professional. Oh, 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 oh. Ah. <laughs> Don't worry, folks. I got it. Yeah. Yes, I was brilliant. <laughs> oh dear, but did you understand what you were illustrating, Scrap? Of course I did. Jesus wants people to be like me and not to be like Mendel. Actually, Scrap, he was teaching the exact opposite of that. He, he was? Yeah. Jesus was saying that his people aren't to act like they're better than others. Instead, uh, we're to look at ourselves and see the areas that we're failing in. And when we find that we're failing and doing the wrong thing, well, we're to ask God to forgive us and, and to change us. We're not to try to make ourselves look better than other people. Oh, so I got that quite wrong. You did, Scruff. Oh. And I still did a pretty good job of acting, didn't I? You did. Cool, maybe I'll go and watch it again, now that I know what it means. See ya! <laughs> See ya, Scruff. For the past few weeks, we've been thinking about living differently as one of Jesus' people. And to help you with that, don't forget you can register at www.quizworks.com slash home delivery so you can get some activity sheets and game and craft ideas and some discussion questions that can help you keep thinking about what it means to follow Jesus, live like Jesus, and become like Jesus too. See you next week. So that was our video from Quizworks. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it helped you think about the story a little bit differently and sort of be able to picture it a bit better in your mind and understand it a bit better. I'll pray now. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your words in the Bible. Thank you so much for the things you have to say to us and lots of helpful things that we can learn from you. I pray that you help us to think about ourselves like we should and also I pray that you help us see other people clearly too. Please bless us this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.